Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I got the email about youth group that I think happened on Friday. I was just getting the details from Caleb who graciously came in this morning to uh, get me online here and so I appreciate that very much. Um, but the email was about the youth group for Friday and they were looking at Proverbs versus Gandalf, or Proverbs or Gandalf. Uh, I don't know if you know J.R.R. Tolkien and The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings series, um, but indulge me to quote a bit from The Hobbit, and my purpose, I believe, will uh, make sense shortly. Uh, Bilbo Baggins, probably the chief character, I guess, of The Hobbit, was sitting at the door of his Hobbit hole uh, when along, along came a, a very imposing stranger who happened to be Gandalf. Bilbo, as a polite fellow, says, good morning. Gandalf replies, what do you mean? Do you wish me a good morning? Or mean that it is a good morning, whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Or that it is a morning to be good on? To which Bilbo replied, all of them at once. And then later on in the conversation, as Bilbo has become increasingly uncomfortable and looking to end their encounter. He says, good morning again to Mr. Gandalf. Uh, and Gandalf replies, what a lot of things you do use good morning for. Now you mean that you want to get rid of me and that it won't be good until I move off. Well, as I say good morning this morning, it is uh, in the sense of hello. I could have said that just as well. But I also say grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've heard these words before if you've ever read the New Testament. Paul starts almost all of his epistles off with these words. And he ends quite a few of them with the words grace be with you as well. Uh, Peter uses a variation of the same. In 1 Peter he says grace and peace be yours in abundance. And in 2 Peter, he says, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. John, in, in 2 John, verse 3, says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. Jude says, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. And in Revelation 1-4, we read, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So when Paul says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What is this? Is this a greeting? Was this common greeting of, our, of, of his time? Just like I might say, hi, how's it going? Or is it a statement of the believer's position? What we already possess in Christ? Or is it a prayer or a blessing? What Paul's desire for them is, or maybe in the words of Bilbo Baggins, it's all of them at once. And I think that to be true. Let's pray again together. Father God, we praise you this morning. We thank you that we have the privilege of being in your presence. We have the joy of Jesus in our hearts. We have your precious word that we can read and study. And I am asking you this morning, Lord, that you would uh, enable me to speak all that you want me to say and communicate clearly. And I pray for all who listen, that they would be blessed, that they would be challenged, encouraged, and built up. So I pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus and for his glory. Amen. 
So I'm going to be thinking about grace and peace this morning, and um, why why grace and peace this morning here on this uh, fine April morning. Well, for me, I don't know if you're like me, you feel like you're living in a world gone mad. That's how I feel. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us when we feel this way. John, uh, the Lord Jesus said in, in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1, we read, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Don't receive God's grace in vain. God's grace is not to be received in vain, it's to be lived in. And I want us to look at that a little bit here this morning. Hebrews 13, 9, and there's a larger context, but I think just looking at the phrase, it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. It is such a reality and such a reality that each one of us needs to take to heart as we live here at the end of the age. And it is a time of trouble, um, but our Lord Jesus has overcome the world. But it's good for us, good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. And in 2 Peter 3.18, we read the admonition, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we're to grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how do we grow in his grace? Do we earn grace? What is grace anyway? And what about peace? What's that? Well, uh, I'm no Greek scholar, but looking at helps that I have, I, I read that this word for grace is in Greek is charis, and is often defined as grace, favor, kindness, blessing. And we'll delve into this a little more as we get into it, but uh, also the word peace is irini, which is quietness, rest, peace, uh, a state of being one. Um, I, you may have heard in biblical languages often they use uh, other terms for the internal organs in terms of peace and this sort of thing. And uh, I look back at the, the Susu language that we spoke in, in West Africa and, and the word for peace was bonyesa, which literally means a liver that's lying down. And of course, uh, contrast that might be ebonyete, which is you're all worked up. Essentially, you're all pent up and, and, and concerned and worried about everything. I was just thinking about this, this aspect of peace. Uh, living here where we live, we have the pleasure of being around so many bodies of water. And, and uh, I drove across Hogsback here, just coming here this morning. And you get there to the falls and the water is raging and rushing down and it's churned up and it's all white. Uh, but then you look to your left on the right morning anyway, and there's Mooney's Bay, just as still and calm as can be. That's a little bit about peace. I'd like to read just, uh, you don't have to turn there, uh, Numbers chapter 6, and the blessing, uh, of priestly blessing. It says, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. I actually just realized this. When I, I'm fairly forgetful. I may have known this in the past, but I, I, I looked this morning, I don't remember why, but I looked this morning up the word smile in the Bible or smiled. And in uh, the modern versions, I could find it one time. 
And that's in the book of Job, in chapter 29 and verse 24. Uh, Job says of people around him, when I smiled at them, they scarcely believed it. The light of my face was precious to them. And I, I think really that as we're looking at Numbers chapter 6, this idea of the Lord make his face shine upon you, as mentioned twice there, I really believe that that's the smile of God. God is smiling on you. So as we think about that, God's smile, living in grace, living in God's presence, having his peace, um, we realize that our starting point for that, as we've already really looked at this morning in the Lord's Supper, um, that starting point is God's kindness to us. In Romans chapter 3, let's read some verses there. It talks about righteousness through faith. It says, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Our starting point, I say, is in grace is that moment of salvation, which actually started before that when God looked upon us with favor. He looked upon all of mankind with love. And we often add the word unmerited to the word favor when defining grace, favor. It, it isn't something that we earned. Did you deserve God's smile? Certainly, we just read in, in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No, we didn't earn it at all. In fact, we were objects of wrath. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, just read some verses there. Verses 1 through 3, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Objects of wrath. So have you ever been in, under anyone's wrath? It's not a pleasant feeling, and I, I bet you that they weren't smiling at you when you were under their wrath. We read on here in Ephesians 2, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions and sins. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace toward us, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Brothers and sisters, God chose to look on you with favor. You didn't earn it. I didn't earn it. And as I think is alluded here to in verse 14, in for all of eternity, we will praise God for him, for, for his wonderful grace to us. Hebrews 2.9 tells us that Jesus suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. 
And we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, passage has often been referred to as the great exchange. Um, one of my favorite passages in scripture. We beg of you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew, knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And we read in Colossians chapter one, verses 19 and 20, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that is Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So I read these portions just to remind us all and to remind anyone out there who's, who's listening, who you, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know the forgiveness of God that comes only through Jesus Christ. Uh, this is our starting point. Do you know him? Have you experienced his grace and salvation? Do you have peace with God? And I was thinking about the aspect that, don't be deceived, the world has borrowed a lot of terminology from, from the Bible. I, I, I get more disturbed all the time, the more biblical words that are being borrowed into the world's system, but without the reality of Jesus Christ in them. Uh, when I'm talking about salvation, there's only one salvation, there's only one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, there's only one God, Jehovah, the creator of all that exists. He is the one who's offering us salvation by his grace, totally his kindness to us. Uh, John 14, 6 John, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So today is the day. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation, you don't know that you're right with God, God offers his righteousness to you. It's a free gift that you cannot earn you can't be good enough for it. It's a gift. It's grace. It's his, his love toward us that, that caused him to do this. So that's our starting point. And I was thinking of Colossians 2, 6, and 7 just, just a while ago. I was jotting that down where we read, Therefore, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. Just as we received him, well, we received him by faith. Uh, again, not our works, but it was his doing. So when we talk about the grace of God toward us in salvation, is this something different than when we're talking about the grace of God for us as believers? Uh, the walk of grace that we have. Well, if you turn over to Titus chapter 2, and if you're wondering where I'm going to be in the scriptures today, um, the answer is all over the New Testament mostly. Uh, but Titus chapter 2, we're dealing, the context is that Paul is writing this letter to Titus, whom he's left in, in Crete, uh, to straighten out what was left unfinished. Um, and there's instructions here for older men and for older women and for older women to teach the younger women. There's instructions for young men and there's instructions for slaves and their relationship with their masters. And so with that context, we pick it up in verse 11. Um, uh, let's back up to verse 10. Um, partway through verse 10, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. 
It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So I hope you picked up on that idea in verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us, now as believers, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live in a godly way. It teaches us that right now. It teaches us that, it says here, in this present age, live godly lives in this present age. So how does that work out? Do we receive God's free gift of salvation, free gift of grace and salvation, and then go on to earn his grace from here on out? Is that the way it works? Is that what godly living is all about? Earning grace, earning God's smile toward us? Is that what it's all about? No, the answer is no. Rather, it's God's grace working in us that enables us to walk in a manner, manner worthy of Christ. It also gives us the desire to do so. John 3 verse 21 says, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. It's God who's accomplishing this in us. He's the one who's enabling us to live the Christian life. Uh, Paul in many places talks about the grace that he received for his ministry. Um, one mention would be in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, when he's talking about what he's done and the work, the work he's done and, and the other apostles. And he says that he labored more than all the others. Well, that sounds like a pretty proud statement, doesn't it? He labored more than all the others. He says, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Paul recognized that his ability to do all the things that he did, the ministries that he was involved in, and the fruit that came from those ministries, it was the grace of God working in him to accomplish those things. Likewise, for us here today, grace is, or it should be, our medium for life. Just like water is the medium for seaweed. That's where it is. That's where it lives. That's where it thrives. You take it out, it fails to thrive. Or that soil is the medium for a tulip bulb. That's where it grows. That's where it needs to be. And so I say grace is, or it should be, our medium for life. And when I say I should be, do, do we have a choice to live in grace? And I think we do. Just like an unbeliever has a choice to believe and be saved. So we as believers, we have a choice to walk in the grace of God right now in this present moment, this grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly passions teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Now, I'd like to suggest that walking in the grace of God is synonymous with some other things that we know. We read this morning, Adam read this morning from John chapter 15, abiding in the vine. And I'd like to suggest to you this morning that this walk in the grace, this living this life in God's grace is synonymous with abiding in the vine. I would say it's synonymous with wearing Jesus' yoke, as per Matthew 11. It's synonymous with 
walking in the spirit of Galatians, 5, uh, Galatians chapter 5. It's synonymous with walking in the light, as per John in 1 John chapter 1. Walking in grace is synonymous with living in our first love relationship with Jesus. As per Jesus' words to the church in Revelation chapter 3. It's synonymous with the fullness of life of John chapter 10, verse 10. And we read in the Psalms, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, it seems like a, a no-brainer, right? As to whether we would walk in God's grace and enjoy him, enjoy his his pleasure and his presence. And yet we constantly make choices to the contrary. Why do I say the world is full of chaos and disturbing? Do I see that as I go out and walk about my day? Yeah, a little bit. But you know, it's probably more of the things that I take in through my ear gate and through my eye gate. Uh, how does the verse go? Um, go to the internet so that you can obtain mercy and find grace and help to help you in your time of need. Is that the way it goes? Oh, no, no, I think that was wrong. Okay, it's let us go boldly before the throne of grace so that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Boldly before the throne of grace. Second Peter chapter three, we, we alluded to that already. I read, I, read, I think, um, verse 18. But uh, the context of this, of this passage is, is the false teachers and the end of the age. <clears throat> and we read in verse 17, therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So he warns them not to fall from their secure position. What is that secure position? It's our walk in grace. Grace isn't a license to sin. Paul said, should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? God forbid. That's not it. That's not what we want. That's not the answer. But we're to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, uh, I, I, I appreciated Adam's analogy of the gardener there this morning. Um, and of his own experience with a hedge. And I was thinking about... I can see by my time, there's a great big glare on that clock and I could use that as an excuse because I could hardly see where the hand is pointing. It looks like my time is about gone. I, I was asked to keep this to around 30 minutes and uh, that's gonna be quite impossible. I'll try to wrap up here in the next five minutes. How's that? Um, the picture of a gardener, you know, you can drive around the city and you can let's you might see a place that you have to say well i don't think that guy owns a lawnmower <clears throat> because he clearly hasn't used one there in like two months right uh and then you can go to another place and and say wow this guy must spend like every waking hour on his lawn and on, on his bushes and on his flowers and all the rest if you think about that in terms of, of our life in grace, what kind of walk of grace do you want to have? 
Do you want to be the guy who just, you've experienced the grace of God and forgiveness in Christ Jesus uh, in your salvation, and, and that's as far as you're taking it. You have no more experience in the grace of God. Or do you want to be the guy who's like the garden who's proactive? He's clearly putting a lot of effort into his relationship. Well, with his garden, but in, in our context of grace, he's putting a lot. You have the option of putting a lot into your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have the opportunity to grow in grace. How much of God do you want? How much of God do you want in your life? Do you want a, a huge experience with God? God offers that to us. We marvel at his grace and salvation, that he would do all he did to save us. And then he offers us, as John puts it in John 1, grace upon grace. Grace smeared upon grace. Grace on top of grace, just this overwhelming grace. He offers that to us. And we're exhorted in scripture to grow in that grace. And so you and I have that opportunity and God's there. He's, he, he responds to us. The ball's in our court as to our walk in grace. I, in some sense, you may have heard the words means of grace. And I wasn't even gonna use those words. They're not really part of my, uh, maybe my uh, church background, if you will. My, they're not really part of my world, I would say, but what's meant, I think, by those who would use those words, means of grace, the things that we can do that enhance our growth in grace, our living in the soil of God's grace. And I've got a whole list of them, and I'm not going to get to any of them in a sense, but, but I will just mention some here. The first one is the presence, of practicing the presence of God. Do you practice his presence? In John chapter 14, we read some amazing words there, really, about the fact that, that God is with us. He lives in us. If you love me, you'll obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Down verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teachings. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. If you're born again this morning, the Spirit of God lives in, in you. The Father and the Son, the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son live in you. And you can enjoy constant fellowship with Him. Am I doing that? I, I as mentioned, I work at a hospital. I go in at work. I'm praying on my way down to work. Lord, I want to just be with you this day. I want to enjoy your friendship. And sadly, some days I go down there around 11 o'clock and I come home around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the evening, 8 o'clock in the evening, and on my way home, I'll say, hi, Jesus, haven't seen you all day, I haven't talked to you all day. Just in the busyness of life, the failure to, to enjoy his presence, to, scripture refers to God's, grace to us is what he's lavished on us he's lavished it on us 
Am I living in that? Are you living in that this morning? That's what God offers you. I hope that you are living in that. And I pray for myself that I will live and enjoy that more and more. That whole aspect of prayer, so important. Pray without ceasing. Are we living that? Obedience was mentioned here in, in, in John. And there's in there, in there um, the idea of the fullness of joy as well. And it sounds like lists of do's and don'ts in our effort. We have the wrong attitude. If that's the way it seems to you. We are living, let us live in the medium of God's grace. These are the things we're to, to grow in. Let that be the soil of our life. I encourage you, if you didn't, just in one last mention uh, of a means of grace, the scripture. If you didn't hear Brian's message last week about the scripture and, and and being in the scripture, I thought it was a fantastic message as he looked at Psalm 119 and uh, he exhorted us to be in the scriptures. Let's do that. Let's be in the scriptures and have that renewing of our minds. Are you anxious? Do you look at the world around you and lose your peace, lose your joy? Let God in his word bathe your mind, renew your mind. My time is gone. Thanks for listening. Let us pray together. Father God, I want to thank you uh, that you are a um, God of grace, God of love, that you offer us your peace, not the kind of peace the world gives, but peace that passes understanding. Thank you, Lord God. I ask your blessing on each one of us, Lord, that we would live in the soil of your grace, knowing how much you love us, how much you delight in us to smile upon us, and to give us your peace. I pray, thank you in Jesus' name, amen.